Everybody, thanks for joining the Drone Club series, uh, Willis Medicine uh, through Virginia Tech Carillion. Uh, this month's session is the August session on marine envenomation. Uh, we're going to go through a chapter since there's no WMS guidelines on marine envenomation. So the chapter by Auerbach is actually fantastic on this. And we'll go through a couple uh, journals, uh, one being an actual research article and then a couple case reports. Um, Kristen, I believe you're presenting the chapter, correct? Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, I, like I said, I enabled screen share, so I'm going to mute myself and uh, take it away when you're ready. All right, so marine envenomation, all of the different things that could either kill you or just cause you to have not such a fun trip to the beach. So for a quick roadmap, um, I'm gonna start with our takeaway points. There are kind of a whole bunch of different animal species that we're gonna be talking about today. Um, and it can be, you can kind of get lost in some of the different details, but you're gonna find that a lot of them have very similar themes to them. Um, and so I'm gonna really try and highlight some of those themes and kind of general points and our takeaway points before going into each of the animals and specifically. Um, we'll kind of start with each animal kind of talking about its habitat, kind of the mechanism of injury and the toxin. Um, and then going on to the symptoms that you might experience, kind of the time course to expect, and then finally what treatment options are available. Um, and then finally, we'll kind of end with uh, antivenom um, and serum sickness. Um, so, you know, most things in wilderness medicine, prevention is key. Um, and well, if you stay inside, you're never going to encounter, you know, the box jellyfish or the stonefish. Um, so your chance of getting, you know, killed by one of those creatures basically goes down to zero. However, since you're here today, you probably are not planning on staying inside. Um, so, you know, making sure that, you know, when you're walking in the sand that you're kind of doing the stingray shuffle and kind of making sure that you're not stepping, you know, directly onto a stingray. Um, when you're out swimming, not standing on the reef, um, or kind of grabbing onto ledges that can cause you to accidentally, you know, grab onto or step onto one of these animals. Um, and in general, just not picking up um, marine creatures is a great way on decreasing your risk. Um, so here you can see kind of a whole bunch of the different species we'll be talking about today. And some of them like, you know, this um, crown of thorns starfish um, or, you know, the sea urchin, they look pretty pointy and you can see easily how you could get uh, kind of injured by them. Um, but some like this little blue ringed octopus, um, it can be a little less um, clear. So with um, these different animals, basic wound management is still going to be kind of your key thing. You're going to treat this as a dirty wound, just like you would for, you know, any other wound that you might experience. Um, you're going to first want to control your bleeding, and then you're going to want to irrigate it. Um, you know, you kind of saw those different, you know, sp spiny or pokey um, kind of objects that can get easily embedded into the skin. And you're going to want to make sure you remove kind of all the different foreign bodies. So sometimes they might be really large, sometimes they're going to be really small. And whether you need to do that at bedside or at the OR really is going to depend on the clinical scenario, right? If you have something that's going through blood vessels or right by tendons, um, or, you know, you're concerned about taking it out because it's next to a vital organs, you're going to probably want to do that in the OR. Um, otherwise, you could do some things at bedside, like using tape. Um, they recommend like facial peel or like um, uh, kind of other adhesive um, kind of like glue and just kind of like putting a thin layer on that to help get that off. Um, you could also try like shaving cream and using a razor to get some of the uh, different um, kind of objects off as well. Imaging is going to be a key thing for many of these because you're not going to want to leave something inside that can act as a nidus for infection or for granuloma formation. Um, you're going to want to make sure the tetanus shot is up to date. Um, a lot of these wounds are going to be at a significant risk for infection. So really thinking about prophylactic antibiotics. Um, you're going to still want to cover your staff and your strep species, but you're also going to be thinking about other, you know, marine specific kind of, you know, bacteria like, um, uh, oh my gosh, um, it'll come to me, <laughs> sorry. Um, 
And then for healing these, you're going to want to heal by secondary intention um, or by a delayed primary closure. You're not going to want to sew this up um, or suture this up right away, again, because of the risk of infection. Um, for your first aid kit, hot water is a key treatment for a lot of these. Um, now the hot water is going to be about 45 degrees Celsius. Um, you're going to soak the extremity for about 30 to 90 minutes. Um, this can actually provide some pretty good pain relief. Uh, vinegar is going to be a common ingredient that can help with decontaminating a lot of these wounds. Um, we already kind of talked about the tape. Antihistamine, whether it's topical or oral, can help um, with kind of the allergic reaction. Um, same thing with steroids. Um, and if you're having a lot of systemic symptoms, kind of having some systemic um, or oral steroids can also be helpful. You could use some lidocaine, um, either just locally or to perform a nerve block to help with pain control. And then for those that are more lethal, considering it, you know, kind of what type of airway supplies you might have uh, to be able to support their airway until um, they're able to kind of get over the toxidrome. And then again, if antibiotics, you know, if you're going to be, you know, days away from a hospital, um, considering that for potential wound infections. So getting started with our sponges. Um, so these are pretty stationary creatures. They live on the sea floor, um, or you might find them in some coral beds. And they're composed of these little spicules. Um, and so here you can kind of see um, all the different shapes of the different spicules that help to determine kind of the different um, kind of classes and breeds and kinds of the, the sponges that are out there. Now some of them have this crinotoxin, um, and really that just acts as a dermal irritant. Um, you might get some swelling, some vesicles, um, if it's kind of near the joints, some joint swelling, some stiffness. Um, if you have these little spicules uh, kind of retained in the skin, they can ultimately form some boulet. If you have a large surface area of skin that's affected, you might get some more of the systemic symptoms. And again, these are very kind of generic, nonspecific symptoms like fevers, chills, malaise, muscle cramps, um, formication, kind of that feeling of, um, you know, kind of uh, insects kind of crawling on your skin. Uh, interestingly, you can have a delayed reaction with developing erythema multiforme or a dyshydrotic eczema. Um, but typically the symptoms, you know, they're going to be stay local kind of on the skin and they're going to resolve within a week. The treatment for this um, is to remove the foreign body. So remove the spicules um, using tape, um, that rubber cement or the facial peel can all be helpful. Um, applying that vinegar um, using topical steroids, antihistamines, or again, if you're having those systemic symptoms, using systemic um, corticosteroids, and still monitoring for risk of infection. Moving on to some worms, and these are the bristle worms. I mean, as, as you can see, they have these kind of very tall, tiny little bristles on them. These are going to be your bottom feeders. You're going to find them in tidal zones um, and all the way to 5,000 meters deep. Um, you can see them, you know, Florida, Caribbeans, Mexico, California, um, Australia. And it's really going to be these little bristles that penetrate the skin um, that cause that irritation. Um, these do not have any venom associated. So it's really all just kind of that, again, kind of dermal kind of contact irritation. You're gonna have this like pricking um, kind of painful sensation. You might get an urticarial rash um, and kind of rarely will it cause um, something more severe like a necrosis. Uh, this is not gonna be super long lived. The pain's maybe for an hour is kind of the urticaria for a couple days. Um, and you can sometimes get a little bit of some skin discoloration with it um, that typically resolves fairly quickly as well. Um, treatment is going to be very similar to our sponges in terms of just removing that foreign body, removing those bristles, and again, kind of using that vinegar, and then systemically you can use the antihistamines or the corticosteroids. So hopefully you're starting to see a little bit of a theme here. Our next um, kind of four different uh, animals we'll be talking about are all in this um, uh, Phylum of Nidaria. Um, so these are going to be your fire corals and Portuguese man of war, your true jellyfish, your anemones, and then uh, most severely your box jellyfish. So for like your Portuguese man of war, um, these tend to be more in your tropical waters. Um, you can have them in the Atlantic, Florida, Gulf of Mexico. Um, and kind of for this whole um, phylum of 
of animals, they all have a pretty similar kind of mechanism of injury. Um, and essentially it's these little uh, nematocysts um, that have these tentacles. So basically you have this little cell, um, this little nematocyst just kind of sitting around on the tentacle or wherever, um, just not doing a whole bunch of anything. You know, the animal gets threatened, it senses, you know, pressure or some other form of change that causes it to release. It kind of opens up and it has this little barb that's attached to this coil that just kind of uh, shoots out. One of the interesting things to know about these is that even if an animal is dead, that these can still um, be deployed. Um, so when you're rescuing or helping somebody who's had um, been envenomated or had a sting from one of these tentacles, um, is that if the tentacles are still there, or if it's an animal that's washed up on shore, um, you know, you're still at risk of, you know, being another person getting injured by this animal. So your symptoms are primarily going to be pain, um, urticaria, and that can ultimately progress more to a hemorrhagic or ulcerating type of lesion. Again, you have very nonspecific systemic symptoms, nausea, vomiting, um, anxiety, abdominal pain, headache. Uh, the pain's going to last for about an hour and a half, um, and the associated inflammation will last for about a week. Your treatment, um, this is kind of one of the exceptions, um, but it's also a little controversial is like the vinegar. Um, and so for Portuguese man of war, you're not going to want to use the vinegar. Um, I think the article said that some people might find that the it can actually help a little bit with the pain, um, but this is kind of really your one exception to, the, to using vinegar would be on the the Portuguese man of war in the, the blue bottle. Um, steroid cream, antihistamines, um, just rinsing it all off in salt water um, and then uh, using the hot water could also be helpful. Um, and if you're by the ocean, salt water is pretty, pretty plentiful. Um, for some of your more systemic symptoms, um, again, you can use corticosteroids. Uh, the corticosteroid taper that they had mentioned um, is about 60 to 100 milligrams, um, kind of tapered over the course of two to three weeks. Um, so kind of a little bit of a higher dose to start off with. For your jellyfish, um, now these are the true jellyfish. Um, you can find these in the Pacific Ocean um, and in the Arctic Ocean, Florida, Brazil, uh, the Caribbean. Um, there's a specific kind called the sea bathers eruption, um, and these are kind of very um, kind of small um, jellyfish that can cause uh, a pretty itchy uh, type of rash. Um, and again, it's really this contact with the tentacles that causes this. Um, so here's an example of the sea bathers eruption. Um, it uh, kind of has this pain, redness, um, and I believe some itching as well. Um, Again, systemic symptoms, pretty, pretty similar to everything else, fever, chills, headache, malaise, vomiting. Um, and these typically resolve over hours to days. Your treatment, again, you're gonna use the vinegar, the hot water, your corticosteroid cream, your antihistamines, and then for your systemic symptoms, your oral steroids. For the sea bathers eruption, um, prevention is gonna be a key thing here. Um, and so one of the big things you can do is to kind of change out of your swimwear as soon as possible um, and to wash your swimwear in really hot water um, and make sure that it dries completely um, because it's really kind of that contact um, with kind of the, the clothing and the skin or like for those who surf like the surfboard and the skin um, that causes that area um, to, to really get um, the eruption. Uh, it's not necessarily just the whole body, but kind of that, that close contact area. Uh, moving on to the sea anemones, you're going to find these in your tidal pools. Um, and again, they have these little tentacles with these stinging um, nidocysts. Um, now, these secrete a little bit of a mucus um, that's cytolytic and has hemolytic toxins. It also has neurotoxins, cardiotoxins, and proteinase inhibitors. And what you're going to find for a lot of the different toxins and venoms that we're talking about, they tend to not just act on one specific area, but usually a whole bunch of different uh, pathways, right? This isn't, you know, a medicine where we want just like one, you know, single pathway. Um, it's a poison, so it's going to act on as about as many things as it possibly can. Um, so here's an example of kind of the um, kind of petechial hemorrhage that you can see with this. Um, it can start off with this central pallor 
and have a halo of erythema. Um, and then sometimes you can get some more vesic vesicles, um, as you can see here, and then ultimately a little bit of some necrosis. And this will last for about 48 hours. Again, vinegar, hot water, corticosteroid cream, antihistamines, um, and oral steroids. Moving on to the box-shaped jellyfish. Um, now, this is the jellyfish that will kill you. Uh, you're going to find these mainly in Australia, um, and uh, these uh, can cause like release of catecholamines, um, including epinephrine and norepinephrine, um, can cause some local vasoconstriction um, and some high blood pressure. And you can see there's the um, kind of your typical kind of box-shaped jellyfish. Um, there's this specific kind, the urjakanji, I believe is how you say it, and that's this smaller one um, that also has its, um, that's in the same class, and it has its own like syndrome kind of associated with it. So now with this, um, you're going to be having more muscle spasms um, and ultimately leading to paralysis. Um, and paralysis is never a good thing, especially if you're swimming. Um, but if you develop paralysis of the diaphragm, you're going to go into respiratory failure. Um, the box-shaped jellyfish, kind of that bigger one I first showed, um, they were saying more of the hypotension versus the tinier ones can cause more of the hypertension and the tachycardia. Um, this one specifically can lead to this cardiomyopathy and troponin leak um, and a hypokinetic heart failure, some pulmonary edema, cerebral edema, intracerebral hemorrhage, basically nothing good. Um, here you can see kind of what a wound of, um, from the tentacles of a box shaped jellyfish, um, what that could look like. Um, again, that pain, rapid blistering and kind of some necrosis. Uh, most of the deaths from these occur within five to 20 minutes. Um, for the urjakanji, it takes a little bit longer, 20 to 30 minutes. Um, and if you're lucky to survive, symptoms typically um, resolve within six to 24 hours. So your treatment, um, you know, for the life-threatening reactions, it's really going to be kind of monitoring your ABCs. If you know you've been stung, um, kind of, you know, getting to a hospital, getting to a place where somebody can monitor you and help to support you, your respirations or your cardiovascular status um, is going to be key. There is an antivenom associated uh, for the box jellyfish. Um, and so you're gonna give either one vial IV or three vials um, intramuscular. And if you're giving it intramuscular, you're gonna give them at different sites. Um, you repeat this every 10 minutes um, for up to three times. And then um, every two to four hours, um, basically until there's no further progression of these systemic symptoms. Um, for the urjakanji envenomation, you're also going to get troponins. Remember the cardiomyopathy, the troponin leak, the heart failure, um, and then kind of using the telemetry. You're going to want to avoid using beta blockers so you don't have this unopposed kind of alpha stimulation. Um, and then for just the local wound, um, you can use vinegar, but that's kind of your smaller thing um, when you're really thinking about your, your life-threatening um, kind of injuries. All right, moving on to kind of a different class. Um, so this is your crown of thorns starfish. Looks pretty cool, um, but definitely super, super spiky. You find this in the Pacific Indian Oceans, um, the Red Sea. You can also find this off the coast of California. And this has the slimy venom um, that's kind of made just under the skin and goes onto the spines. Uh, it has kind of this saponin or histamine-like compounds um, that ultimately leads to hemolytic, uh, myotoxic, myonecrotic, and um, has an anticoagulant effect to it, which is why you get a lot of pain and um, a lot of bleeding specifically with this. Um, you can get a little bit more of a dusky wound. Um, you're going to get some paresthesias with this as well. Um, you can get some nausea, some vomiting, lymphadenopathy, um, and in a pretty severe case, would get some paralysis. Typically lasts for about 30 minutes to three hours, so fortunately not, not too long. Um, for treatment, um, you're going to want to irrigate this. You're going to want to remove those spines. Um, and again, kind of imaging to make sure that you're not missing any spines, leaving any spines in um, so that you, you can get all of them out. 
using some hot water for pain control um, or just like a nerve nerve blocker using some local lidocaine. Um, and then using kind of systemic corticosteroid if you're having like uh, like a reactive neuropathy or kind of some more nerve related kind of pain or symptoms. Very similarly is your sea urchin. Um, now these tend to be nocturnal creatures. Um, they're kind of more on the rocky bottoms um, in the intertidal kind of regions. Um, and these calcified spines uh, can also contain venom. So some of them are hollow and contain venom and some of them um, are more solid filled and have like a rounded tip. Um, and interestingly, some of these have this little like pedicularity, like organelle that can cause these spines to like move um, with you or like kind of pointing them towards if they start to feel threatened um, really to maximize the number of spines that you could get in your hand or your foot or whatever, you know, comes in contact with it. Um, again, these have all sorts of different uh, compounds in them. Um, there's these steroid glycosides, hemolysins, proteases, serotonin, cholinergic substances, basically a whole bunch of just, you know, different toxins kind of in this, this venom. So um, one of the interesting things with this that you should really know about is if you get a spine in the joint, it can cause a synovitis. Um, and if it's not like recognized and appropriately treated, it can ultimately lead to like an arthritis picture. Um, so that's going to be something you're going to really want to pay attention to, um, especially thinking about some of the small joints in like your hands or in your feet. Um, another interesting thing is you can get this discoloration um, and that can last uh, for a couple days. The discoloration doesn't necessarily mean that there's still a spine embedded in there. Um, there could be, but there might not be. Um, so it's not, you know, kind of like a, oh, I've removed the spine, now the discoloration should go away. Um, and then, you know, these symptoms typically last for about a day or so. Treatment um, is just like you're going to do with that starfish, kind of remove the spines, ear gate, image, um, and provide good pain control. Stingrays um, have uh, are kind of found in the tropical and subtropical waters. Um, they are typically in more shallow waters. Um, so again, kind of that stingray shuffle that you might have heard about, where you're not like you know stepping your foot up and down, but kind of just shuffling through the the sand to let them know that you're there. Um, they tend to not um, be you know they're a little bit more of a shyer creature. Um, and don't really want to attack you, but you know if you're going to step on them, they're going to have this like whip-like reflex of their tail, um, and it has um, this little spike that'll essentially impale you. Um, and it has kind of, as you can see, it's kind of um, it's these like retrograded like spine-like lesions kind of on both sides. And the most injuries for the stingrays tend to be more from the injury of the actual like stab wound um, than so much from the the toxin. The toxin, you know, has serotonin, some nucleotidase, some phosphodiesterase um, that can cause vasoconstriction, bradycardia, tachycardia, AV block, and seizures. Um, but I think most people that uh, get an injury from the stingray, it's primarily from kind of that impalement. Um, so obviously, as you can imagine, there's going to be a whole bunch of pain um, and some swelling. Um, you're going to get some bleeding and then eventually can get a hemorrhagic uh, kind of necrosis. Um, you know, again, kind of your systemic symptoms, weakness, nausea, vomiting, syncope, seizures, arrhythmias. Um, your this is going to kind of peak around 30 to 60 minutes and last for about two days. Um, so again, this is another one where you're really going to want to image to try and find, um, you know, if there's still part of that, that barb kind of left inside um, and going to the operating room again, if it's near any form of vital structure before just removing it. Um, and that's really where this could be kind of the life threatening is if it's getting involved with some of these other organs. Um, otherwise, you're going to use, you know, your pain control. Um, and then again, just really watching for ulceration and infection risk for these. Cone snails are another one that can kill you. Um, and so they're not, you know, the biggest snail in the world. Um, and they tend to live in the Indo-Pacific um, kind of shallow waters, um, but they are, you know, hunters. Um, and so they have this little proboscis, um, which is kind of this lower thing. And it has this little venom sac that's kind of associated with this radicular tooth um, that essentially like shoots out and like harpoons 
uh, to catch its prey. Um, it happens pretty fast um, and really kind of fun to watch. Um, it has a conotoxin, um, conefish conotoxin, not super creative, and it affects the neuromuscular junction. Um, so yeah, the symptoms that you can imagine are gonna be primarily your nerve-related symptoms, um, including affecting the phrenic nerve, which includes paralyzing the diaphragm, which leads to respiratory failure. So um, not, again, one that you want to really be in contact with. Um, can cause some cyanosis, some paresthesias from a kind of the neuromuscular uh, kind of blockade. But again, uh, it's really that, you know, paralysis of the diaphragm, that respiratory failure, that's kind of the, the crucial aspect for this, this cone snail. Um, and this can last anywhere between 12 to 36 uh, hours. Your symptom um, for your treatment, you're going to be focusing on the ABCs. Um, for this one, they mentioned using naloxone for hypotension, about two to four milligrams. Um, and the other one that they mentioned was um, using the edrophonium um, and using 10 milligrams of that IV. That's the one that you might recall is used for myasthenia gravis. Um, and um, sometimes you can get, uh, you know, just kind of different reactions that you can use the IV atropine with um, to help kind of combat that. So the other thing they mentioned for this was a pressure immobilization. Um, and this is where essentially you will wrap the extremity with like an ACE bandage or ACE wrap kind of um, completely up. And they kind of mentioned using about kind of the same kind of tightness as you would for like splinting an extremity. Um, and so just kind of keeping that kind of wrapped up to really kind of minimize the spread of, of the toxin going up, you know, everywhere. This is more of like occluding the lymphatics and the venous and not so much so tight as to occlude the arterial like you would for like a, you know, a combat tourniquet to stop a bleed. Um, and um, yeah, I think the other thing is like when you take the this uh, pressure bandage off, um, there's kind of this, I don't know if it's a theoretical or an actual risk of the venom just kind of like having a venom bolus kind of go throughout your system. Um, so if you're gonna take it down, just hopefully you're in a place that can kind of manage the ABCs. Um, and then, yeah, so another one that can kill you is the blue ringed octopus. So this little guy is about 20 centimeters or like eight inches. Um, and they live in the Indo-Pacific and they tend to be in more of these shallow water kind of rock pools. And when they get threatened, um, they really kind of light up these like really iridescent, like bright blue circles. Um, and to everybody else or other creatures in the ocean, they kind of know to back off. Um, but humans, you know, can find this really, you know, beautiful, attractive, kind of curious, um, and will end up picking this up, putting it on their shoulder, handling it, in which case um, the octopus then bites you. It has this little beak um, kind of on the underside and injects its venom. And it has enough venom to basically kill like 10 people. So it's, it's pretty impressive. Uh, it has this maculotoxin or the cephalotoxin. Um, and part of what's in this is tritototoxin. Now you might remember or recall tritototoxin from your pufferfish. And that's why that these, uh, the pufferfish, you know, have to be prepared by, you know, a special chef so that you don't accidentally get this toxin into you. Um, some people like it because it has that little bit of that perioral kind of numbness, tingling type of sensation if you get like just a little bit, um, because that's really because this blocks the voltage gated uh, sodium channels. Um, so again, kind of acting, you know, at that neuromuscular junction and kind of um, acting on the nerves. So kind of like we talked before, if you start to, you know, get this tritototoxin or kind of these other toxins, um, you know, first you might get a little bit of that oral facial numbness, um, but ultimately that's going to lead to this flaccid paralysis um, and respiratory failure leading to cardiac arrest. Um, you know, the, this one, the wound, the bite wound isn't, you know, that all that impressive. Um, it's just like these two little poke, like, you know, poke wounds um, or puncture sites. Um, it's really kind of the systemic um, symptoms. That's that's the, the main thing. Um, some people might not even know, you know, kind of where that they they have been been bit. 
And impressively, these symptoms are gonna start within 15 minutes. Um, and the paralysis will last for about four to 10 hours. Now, if you don't have any like agnostic, like brain injury or other hypoxic sequelae, it'll take about two to four days to recover. So as long as you are able to maintain, you know, intubate a person, maintain their respirations and their breathing status, um, people can do just fine. Um, but you have to act, you know, pretty quickly because like I said, this starts within 15 minutes. Um, moving on to our scorpion fish. Um, so kind of going from our least toxic to our most toxic, you have your lionfish, your scorpion fish, um, and your stonefish. So you have the lionfish kind of pictured up top and the stonefish um, pictured down below. Um, and so you can see kind of all of these little spines um, and they have this associated venom glands um, that are covered by the integumentary sheaths um, that contain this toxin. Um, and the toxin will essentially just break down connective tissue, uh, ultimately lead to some hypotension, pulmonary edema and paralysis. Um, Again, you can also have uh, pericarditis and AV heart block, um, heart failure, pulmonary edema, um, all sorts of not great things that uh, can and will kill you. Um, you're gonna get a little bit of the paresthesias, again, because it's uh, impacting the nerves, ischemia, cyanosis, vesicles, um, and leading to you know, tissue sloughing, necrosis, you know, cellulitis infection. Um, one of the really cool things about this fish um, is that the pain can be so severe that it causes like delirium and hallucinations. Um, so treating the pain control is gonna be really important for this um, given how significant it is. The pain will peak within uh, 60 to 90 minutes. Um, death will usually occur within six to eight hours. And if you're lucky to survive, the wound um, can take up to you know, several months to heal. Fortunately for something so deadly, we do have a stonefish antivenom um, that can be used. Um, again, you're also gonna want to just to, you know, irrigate, remove foreign bodies um, and provide really good pain control. Our last animal is gonna be our sea snake, again, found in the Indo-Pacific Ocean. Um, and these are primarily from a bite mechanism. Um, so one of the, I guess, fortunate things about the sea snake uh, is while it can, um, you know, kill you, it's, I read about 80% of the bites actually don't contain any venom. Um, so that's a nice thing that, you know, your chances are better that just because you got bit, you didn't necessarily get envenomated, but given the severity of kind of the symptoms being life-threatening still probably warrants being observed in the hospital. Um, these act on the acetylcholine receptors um, and they also have a hemolytic and myotoxic compound. So um, for some of the specific symptoms for this that are kind of unique um, is that there can be some electrolyte disturb disturbances, specifically like hyperkalemia. Um, and it can also have rhabdomyolysis um, that leads to myoglobinuria. So that really dark uh, kind of urine um, and ultimately can lead to acute renal failure. Uh, typically 30 to 60 minutes is when this is gonna start. Um, and if by six to eight hours you haven't had anything and no, um, remain symptom-free, uh, it's pretty unlikely that you've been envenomated by this. Your uh, treatment is going to be that pressure mobilization, like we talked about before. Um, they do have an antivenom for this. Um, and then you're just going to primarily support their respirations, you know, your ABCs. If um, they start to have the myoglobinuria, if you can um, use sodium bicarb to alkalinize their urine, as well as using other diuretics. Um, and again, there's dialysis if they go into pulmonary renal failure. So about 25% of people will die without treatment. Um, but when you kind of look overall, uh, mortality rates about uh, closer to 3%. So we've talked about a couple different animals that have antivenom associated with it, um, but antivenom is not without risk. Um, it can cause anaphylaxis and it's gonna be all of your typical kind of anaphylactic symptoms. And you're gonna treat it the same way with epinephrine. These are usually gonna come on between 15 to 30 minutes and rarely is it gonna, are you gonna find this for six hours after you gave the antivenom. 
one of the unique things is because you are essentially needing to give the antivenom so they don't die, however you need to treat the anaphylaxis so they don't die, is you're going to give um, a, like a small amount of the antivenom and then a small amount of epinephrine and kind of like go back and forth um, to make sure that they're getting both um, so that they don't die from either one. Um, sometimes you might need an epinephrine drip for this. Um, and another thing that could be helpful is to pre-treat them uh, with some IV Benadryl. The serum sickness is more of a delayed reaction. This is going to be 8 to 24 days after they've gotten the antivenom. And this is where they develop an IgG antibody to the antivenom antigen. Um, and that's what causes the serum sickness. It's going to look like fever, arthralgias, malaise, uh, urticaria, rashes. Um, and the treatment for this is primarily using steroids um, and kind of tapering that over the course of two weeks. So kind of getting back to our big takeaways, prevention is gonna be key. So it's gonna be making sure that you're not handling and touching the different marine creatures, um, you know, that you're not accidentally stepping on them, whether it's, you know, you're walking on the sand, um, kind of wading out, uh, or, you know, you're scuba diving and you're kind of near the, you know, coral reefs. Uh, pain control, that can be done with your hot water. That's going to be that 45 degrees Celsius. You're going to be soaking the extremity for 30 to 90 minutes until you get good pain relief. You can also use, um, you know, topical steroids or using like a nerve block or other local lidocaine injections. You're going to want to remove the foreign body, um, whether that's bedside or the OR. Um, you can use kind of adhesive tapes, um, rubber cement, the facial uh, peels, um, or kind of the shaving cream uh, with the razor that's um, specifically for like your, your jellyfish um, and type of, of um, you know, foreign bodies. Um, and then again, kind of your infection risk, um, kind of, you know, treating with antibiotics um, kind of prophylactically or just at least watching the wound really closely for signs of, of infection. And just to kind of recap, the ones that you should be most worried about that can kill you would be the box jellyfish, uh, the Ur Urkongia um, jellyfish, the cone snails, the blue ringed octopus, uh, your stonefish, and your sea snakes. So with that, what questions do people have? I have a question about um, if someone has anaphylactic reaction and you're doing the alternating epi and antivenom, are you going to um, alter your dose a little bit? Like what dose are you giving alternating with epi? Yeah, I think they had mentioned you're going to be using um, like 0.1 to 0.2 mils of the aliquot of the antivenom um, and then using like 0.03 to 0.1 milligrams of uh, the IV epinephrine. Um, or titrating the epinephrine to a heart rate less than 150. Thank you. Also a great presentation. Thank you for making that. All right, sorry if you hear dogs in the background. They're playing. Um, thanks for covering that. That one's, I know, very dense, uh, but it covers all the cool stuff, or at least what I think is cool. Uh, <laughs> there's just not enough uh, time to cover articles on each individual thing. Um, I just wanted to mention some real brief highlights on stuff I read regarding the uh, sea of stars, or crown of thorns starfish. There was one article I read about a girl who uh, stepped directly on top of one and she had, I can't remember how many spines that they found in her foot, um, but they, basically missed quite a few on extraction and she ended up having uh, obviously quite a bit of pain. She ended up getting a couple of recurring infections and it was the first documented case of getting transaminitis from it. I think she developed AST and ALT in the mid 400s, I believe it completely resolved, but I don't think they had noticed that before. Um, then there was another one with the sea urchin, uh, stingray barb and a guy's uh, wrist. Uh, and they missed that, and he ended up getting tenosynovitis, 
and I think he lost permanent flexion in his fourth and fifth fingers. So um, not as fun to like uh, think about as all the cool envenomations, but uh, most of these things are a mix of both a focal trauma and uh, envenomation and potential foreign body. So yeah, I do have to think about both. Um, and then there was a case of a diver who was, I think it was, I mean, he didn't say time of day, but it was after dark. And he was ascending after a dive. Uh, he was completely covered head to toe, except he was not wearing a hood. And uh, he just ran directly into a Portuguese man of war, like right on the face. And he was stung um, quite a bit. He ended up in the, I think he was in the ER for eight hours. Um, he just needed supportive care, oxygen. But there was a, a case report of a death where a guy got like so tangled up in a Portuguese man of war tentacles and then he thrashed around and so the tentacles essentially wrapped around him and you know, he died. So even just a little more Portuguese man of war that you see all across the coast of Florida will get you. Um, basically, I recommend uh, being fully covered, including a hood if you're diving and have your hand up when you ascend classic teaching as far as open water even. Um, so classically with a stingray, where is the location on the body that you will get this, the barb embedded in you? Anybody know? Yeah. Foot or lower extremity? What age group and uh, particular subset of people get it in the arm or the hand? I'm sure it's just think of it like snake bites. It's the tease. So um, it's guys <laughs> like eight, eight teens to like 30 year old guys will get stingray stuff to their uh, hands because they're grabbing them. Kids and guys grab stuff. So mostly it's just, it's not just the grabbing. I talked to we see it a lot in our fishermen. So they'll hook a stingray yeah. when they're fishing on the beach and mm. then they're trying to take it off their line. And that's yeah. oftentimes when they'll get hit. So it's very, very common in, in uh, fishermen at the beach, which is, again, is more guys than, than women. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, anyway, from there on, I know it's, uh, it was a dense one because there's so much. But Chris, and thanks for doing such a good job on it. Uh, who feels ready as far as article presenters to take it away for the next one? I can go next. It's Gabby. All right, go ahead. I'll mute myself. All right, so hopefully you guys can hear me and see me. So uh, what we were just talking about leads pretty well into this article um, or, or this research study. Um, it's fairly straightforward, so I'll kind of run through it quick. Uh, a lot of you guys seem to have experience with, with stingrays already. So uh, very relevant to us here in Tampa, Florida. We see these everywhere all the time. Any sandy spot here in Tampa, you can pretty much be assured that uh, in salt water, you're gonna have some nice rays hiding there. So. This study is the comparison of radiographic ultrasound and MRI for detection of retained stingray barbs. It was a cadaveric study. So here's what I'll talk about. Okay, so basically this study, these pictures are not from this study. These are just uh, nice images. If you talk to any old fisherman, they'll tell you that the best thing to do is put your foot or whatever area of your body has the barb in it, put it in scalding hot water as hot as you can handle and uh, it should come out and you should be fine. So a lot of fishermen kind of live by that. And clinically, that's probably uh, pretty good advice. So the article itself was conducted by some folks at the Department of Emergency Medicine for LA County and um, the University of San Diego Medical Center. Uh, so this uh, really relates more to the California maritime environment, but um, you could potentially extend these findings to other types of stingrays, particularly those that we might see down here in Florida uh, or even up on the Gulf Coast. So this is an original research paper. And basically what they were looking at is what is the optimal imaging modality for detecting a stingray barb 
They found that that's not really been well characterized in existing literature. There's no current standard recommendation across the board for what the best modality is. Just in my literature search, it seems like x-ray is the most common. Uh, it's generally accepted that stingray barbs are radio opaque, so x-ray uh, is a simple cost-effective way to detect them if they are retained. So this has kind of already been covered, but uh, of course the stingray is known for its barb, which looks like a terrifying serrated saw blade, so you can see a close-up image there. So that barb is made of vasodentin, which is an extremely strong cartilaginous material, and it's covered with a skin sheath, which has mucous membranes in it. And when they release that barb into the victim, that skin sheath is torn, and uh, that tearing of the skin releases the venom into the victim. So you can see that little graphic up there on the top left kind of showing. So of course, a risk with this is not just the, the barb, the penetration injury, but the uh, inflammation and potential secondary infection that can be caused by that venom and other bacteria and other um, organic material entering into that wound. So this paper focused on the round stingray. You can see on the bottom left there, the round stingray's territory. Again, this is more uh, Pacific, but round stingrays are not um, just seen in that area. That was just the focus for the study. Round stingrays are an ideal species for this type of study because they're, like I said, pretty standard. Um, the barbs are um, pretty commonly seen, at least on the West Coast, as far as uh, retained foreign body injuries. So the study aim was to compare the accuracy of plain radiograph, ultrasound, and MRI, like I said, to detect a retained barb in the human foot or ankle, which, as we discussed, is the most common overall site for retained barbs. So basically for the study design, what these guys did, guys and gals, is they uh, took sample barbs from stingrays and they actually retained them. So they weren't fresh injuries. They retained the barbs, they clipped them, which there's a picture of clipping a barb. It's kind of like cutting a nail. It doesn't harm the stingray in any way. And uh, stingrays, lovely creatures that they are, usually grow back their barbs until they're pretty old, at, at which point um, sometimes they won't grow it back. But they'll oftentimes grow these things back unless you clip the tail. So fishermen, what they'll sometimes do, especially here in Florida, I know, if you talk to them, they will clip the tail of the stingray. So uh, if you're out there, you can see a lot of stingrays with no tail, with a weird clip tail, uh, and, and that just makes it a little safer to be out wade fishing in that. So um, what they did is they randomized the presence or absence of a barb in predetermined locations on the 12 uh, fresh frozen cadaver feet and ankle specimens that they got um, from the hospital there. So there was one foot site and one ankle site per um, person who came in to try to see if there was a foreign body retained in the samples. So uh, of those foot sites and ankle sites, they included uh, medial arch, lateral arch, the heel, the medial malleolus, lateral malleolus, and the posterior calf, because of course uh, the calf can, can be a site for that as well. So the people who actually did the review, they were blinded to which extremity and which specific site on the extremity the barb was or was not placed in. And then uh, they were given a 20 minute didactic session, uh, just reviewing the basically the principles of soft tissue ultrasound. And then they conducted their own ultrasound of the samples they were given. They conducted their own x-rays and then they basically marked yes or no, did they detect a foreign body? And then uh, one board certified musculoskeletal uh, attending radiologist conducted the MRI portion. So, the reason that they chose to use these round barbs, which that's a good picture of one right there, uh, round stingray barbs, is because uh, they were able to clip fragments from those barbs that was similar in size to what you would expect from maybe a cactus spine, another common injury you could see in the Southwest or in California, as well as uh, organic material like a wooden splinter. So, uh, of course, the goal being that if we could see a barb, maybe this would help us understand which modality uh, we could use to see similar sized objects, right? Different material, but similar size. So for each modality, you can see the things there that they uh, that they calculated as part of their methods. And the sample included a total sample size of 430 um, actual injuries um, that they created, right? So they, they pushed these retained uh, barbs that they took from round stingrays over a course of six months, pushed them into the cadaver until you couldn't see them and you couldn't palpate them, 430 of them total. And you can see there that they ultimately determined that uh, an alpha less than 0 0.05, they had a, an 80% power to detect a uh, foreign body, whether it was retained or not. So here's one of the images. Uh, hopefully you guys can see this. So the top left, uh, your A is x-ray. So you can see the barb there pretty nicely. 
Um, B is, uh, of course, uh, sagittal um, MRI imaging. So you can still kind of see the barb down there in the left. And then C on the same sample is ultrasound. Uh, so uh, maybe I'm the only one on this, but I think that's uh, pretty, pretty hard to see. So, and when you look at other images of ultrasound for uh, stingray barbs, it's, it's pretty tricky. So those are some of the examples there of what they were comparing. And of course that one you can see is nicely implanted there in the heel. So what they found is that um, there was no difference in correct identification based on level of training. So some of the reviewers were emergency med folks, some of them were radiologists, and there was no difference based on level of training itself. However, the radiologists performed better on ultrasound uh, versus the EM guys, and that's kind of to be expected. The heel was the easiest identification location. The medial arch was the hardest for x-ray and the medial and then lateral malleoli were the hardest for MRI. And if you kind of think about the anatomy in those areas, right? So the, the malleoli, uh, you don't have a lot of soft tissue to provide contrast for an MRI. And then of course the medial arch, um, you're gonna have contrast issues there on an x-ray. So that kind of all makes sense. And then you can see the data there. Uh, the MRI guy, he did pretty good on the heel, the lateral arch, posterior calf, uh, but definitely had some issues identifying uh, whether there was uh, a barb with the, the heel itself. So their basic conclusion is that the highest sensitivity in general was x-ray. Both the emergency med and the radiologists had the same accuracy on x-ray. Basically, uh, if you look at this here, you can see x-ray is the, if you can see the coloring, it's kind of the white one in the middle. So overall, pretty good accuracy, almost 100% in most of the locations. So their recommendation was to use x-ray as your first modality or kind of go-to. And then the highest specificity was the MRI. The lowest sensitivity and specificity, as I mentioned, ultrasound. Uh, there might be some confounding variables with that, such as the fact that, um, for example, a radiologist might have more specialized ultrasound training, right? But in general, x-ray was kind of the go-to. So as far as weaknesses, uh, just worth mentioning that it wasn't really a head-to-head -head comparison. They were using folks from different specialties, which again, if you have an experienced radiologist or experience uh, with MRI, then you're gonna get uh, probably slightly different interpretation than uh, an attending or a resident in emergency medicine. So some of the limitations for one, do all barbs image equally? Well, uh, there's a picture there of some of the main classifications. I don't know what any of those are, but basically there's a lot of types of stingrays and there's a lot of types of stingray barbs and they look different. Some are huge and really scary. Um, the one that got Steve Irwin was gigantic. If you look at those type of barbs, the round stingray barbs, um, generally a little smaller, a little thinner. So uh, how does that mess up your imaging or maybe make it easier? Well, we don't know. It wasn't in the study. Uh, another limitation here is that the barbs that they use, like I said, they were clipped samples from round stingray barbs. So they weren't in that sheath and that sheath that produces the venom and can potentially break off the barb at a certain point. So when you're taking it out of an in vivo situation, just clipping it and putting it into a cadaver, uh, you might lose some accuracy as far as what the imaging would look like in vivo. So that speaks to the next point. This is a cadaver study. Uh, you don't get the inflammatory reaction and the actual wound creation that you would get um, probably in an in vivo situation with a person on a beach, right? So that, of course, that inflammatory reaction, swelling can show up differently on imaging, maybe help point to an actual foreign body, um, but we didn't have that in this case. And then, of course, provider comfort and experience do matter. Uh, user error was talked about a little bit towards the end. Again, if you have, you know, a young resident versus an experienced um, uh, radiologists, there's going to be some differences there. Uh, another technique that's used commonly with ultrasound is using a water bath to detect foreign bodies. In this case, that was uh, not done. They didn't really explain why, but that was not done. So that might have uh, further made it difficult to detect the foreign bodies on ultrasound and led to less uh, specificity and sensitivity. So the clinical context of this is, you know, like I said, they, they say that x-ray should be the go-to. I think that's generally um, probably what's done anyway. That's what it sounds like. This is from WMS. This is um, a paper from 2015, but they go into a lot more detail about stingrays in general, stingray injuries. But they say that uh, stingray spines and barbs can be radio opaque, right? Because that's going to be the determining factor is if they're radio opaque, then of course, radiograph is a pretty cost-effective way to detect them. Uh, but if they're not radio opaque, then maybe MRI or ultrasound is better. So they think that they are generally radio opaque, which makes sense because if you look at the, the material they're made out of, that vasodentin, 
uh, it, it's almost like bone, but it's cartilaginous. So radiographs, ultrasounds can both be helpful in detection. This poor guy is soaking in a nice hot water bath, obviously, and you can see the size of the barb that got him right there in the meat of his calf. So these are not from the paper. I just wanted to give some other examples. These are all x-ray, obviously, um, but you can see some real life examples in vivo of uh, different types of uh, locations and barbs. Some of them are pretty obvious, but some of them you really have to get the, uh, the lateral angles like you can see on the bottom so that you can see that little shard there. It almost looks like a splinter. Um, so you know, keep that in mind if you're just doing a plain x-ray, make sure you get all those angles. So that's, I wish I could say my stingray, it's totally not. Um, borrowed it for about five minutes, drove it for about five minutes, and then my friend was like, you're done with this. So um, that's the closest I've gotten to stingrays other than being on the beach in Florida. So uh, with that uh, pretty straightforward article, just uh, x-ray as your go-to, I think uh, you can't go wrong with that. So happy to open it up if anyone has comments or disagrees, please let me know, thanks. Any questions about that article? Ken Bourne is, is one of the authors of that paper. Any uh, points you'd like to make? No, I think yeah, you did a really good job summarizing. Uh, that was really good, an excellent overview. Um, I will say we actually had the 2015 article that was kind of one of the things we started with um, and thought that ultrasound would do a lot better than it actually did. Um, it was actually pretty much a toss up. So despite what up to date tells you, and despite some of the other literature out there, I would stay away from ultrasound if you're trying to look for stingray, um, or frankly, any marine envenomation retained foreign bodies, because uh, it's, it's pretty much impossible to see stuff. Uh, I'd also recommend, I guess in any case, and you should do this with any patient you see, but look at your own images. Um, I know it's hard, uh, especially now as an attending when I'm staffing with ACPs and residents in my own cases, but look at all your own images because radiologists, despite spending all their time in dark rooms, um, can miss stuff. So and they don't have the context you do. So uh, just look at all your own pictures too, especially for foreign bodies. Um, I will also give one other point and this covers what we talked about previously. Um, so it it is not typically my practice and most of a practice of those of us that do this research down here in San Diego to image everybody who comes to the door with a stingray injury or with a marine in injury. Um, typically we will reserve both imaging and antibiotics for bounce backs. So it's the folks who come in with, you know, a red hot foot three days later or a week later. Um, but typically if you just, just got hit at the beach and you came right to our department and just need pain control, that's all you're going to get. Um, we don't typically do antibiotics or imaging unless you are a, uh, we call it poor host. So unless you have, you know, other under underlying medical conditions that are going to put you at high risk. Any other questions about how to image marine foreign bodies? It's definitely not something you see uh, inland as much. Although uh, with people getting so much more involved in like exotic pet keeping um, and like aquariums throughout the country, but doesn't particularly 100% mean you won't see it in a land bound, landlocked state. All right. Um, just to mix it up so we don't have two back-to-back -back stingray articles. Hey, Drew, can you present the stonefish article? Yes, I can. Mm -hmm. Sorry, just moves some stuff. Get back. Oh, it shows I haven't used PowerPoint in a bit. So we have a little article on uh, stonefish poisoning. So uh, from what I've learned from this article that um, stonefish are mean. 
they're very well camouflaged and some of the pictures I sat there for a while what and trying to figure out where's the fish in the picture and the fish is the picture and the, the venom is all in their dorsal spine so that if you're walking the foot up foot down not doing the um sand shuffle which was recommended something i saw it was similar context of if you can get under it it's going to move or be less likely to sting you because its venom is in dorsal spines then go through a half centimeter of soft rubber soles so even if you've got uh, i mean your phone flip-flops they won't help uh some of the thicker diving shoes are recommended, some of the fins, but the problem is with fins, can't really walk in them. Their toxin is the, the Veruca toxin. Pain, respiratory weakness, intense pain. Cardiovascular damage, paralysis, occasionally death. The three reported deaths, one was the potential for a possibly unluckily intravenous dose of the venom and the other two were prolonged and were arguably from secondary infection from a nasty stab wound on the foot but not but they were not they were attributed to the stonefish but not kind of directly and through some other articles read the uh it's their toxin is more effective on L-type calcium channels with the vasoconstriction, but they had a menagerie of other effects that were being investigated. So our case, Vanuatu, which looks gorgeous. Stonefish love warm, shallow water, which is perfect for Vanuatu. 49-year-old male goes diving uh, for the sake of weight and having to fly with everything. They leave their personal dive gear at home and opt to rent or purchase whatever's on their tour locally. They end up with the barefoot fins that just were strapped behind and are hopeless to walk in. They didn't bring dive boots, so they've got to where they're going out to investigate the, uh, is this the President Coolidge here. They have to shuffle out in the water and shuffle back in the water in its waist deep, warm, beautiful, exactly where I'd want to be in a stonefish would too. So he steps on a stonefish because he sees it um, shuffle off and he is carried to the local hospital by some divers and you go from there. So this is actually a picture from the report of when they get to the hospital, they find he's got three puncture wounds and the hematoma in his left foot. Uh, their terminology is intolerable pain and paresthesias in his left leg. His left leg, his left foot, they're red, they're swollen. He's tachycardic. I'm not sure if he'd be hypotensive. This is what in the case report. And they are unable to palpate a dorsalis and posterior tibialis pulse. He's got decreased cap refill on his toes. So their first thoughts um, were pain control just in the injury and while some of the things I read were lidocaine was an option, they unfortunately used lidocaine with epi. And this compounded and probably amplified the vasoconstrictive effects of the stonefish venom itself. They then gave enough fluid for KBO and penicillin every six hours. And he was told, cool, you'll hang out here tonight. You'll be good to go in the morning. By the next day, his left leg is mobile, painful, has clear pockets of fluid. It's blistered. He has a distinct red line up to his mid thigh. He's febrile. He's tachycardic. He's got a temp of like 38 2. And because he's now, he's still in intractable pain, they do a femoral nerve block. He's got mac, um, was it macroscopic hematuria. And unfortunately, Vanuatu is in the middle of the screen here. The nearest anti venom is in Australia which the antivenom has to stay cold and the, the transportation difficulties exist. So their only option is how do we get this guy out of here? After some wrangling of between visas and transport itself, including borrowing the only ambulance available to get this man to a private flight to Australia, he gets to Australia where he's met and they deem him to be outside of a 
the effective treatment window of the anti-venom and B, the, the damage is done. There's no point in giving the antivenom now. He's given IV antibiotics. His wounds are treated. And after a month, he's able to use crutches. Uh, several months later, he will see end up with a four centimeter ulcer on the underside of his left foot. And eventually they did return to Brazil. And eventually he did get recovery, but it was not easy. So what went wrong? Um, as we've been discussing with the toxins, they're very heat labile and immersion was the solution for denaturing the toxin. Inside of, an, inside of 48 hours, antivenom was useful. Uh, but again, it's horse derives. We went over the serum sickness and they did discuss the what if your patient has a reaction to this and it was the pre-treatment and mitigation of the reaction while they're being given the antivenom because they need to get rid of the venom, but also the antivenom is not exactly completely inert. The point was uh, knowledge of the local possibly hostile flora or fauna, proper footwear, the proper dive shoes, protecting yourself and having a planned for if something were to go wrong, how are we going to get to more care? Because they, they got hung up for a bit when they were trying to get this guy out of uh, Vanuatu that they had to seek emergency visa authorizations to get this guy out because they didn't have a plan. And admittedly, I, I haven't when I've gone places. Now I might think a little more about that. Um, one thing I just, there are two things I thought was interesting by reading this, and I'm sorry if you mentioned this, but, uh, I, I don't know what it's like it outside the U S I've only worked in the U S but I thought it was interesting that the, the nurse without like discussing with any other, uh, providers first off did it without needing an order and did a procedure without looking to somebody else injected lidocaine with epi directly into the wound as like um, her first, I think it says, yep, it is a female, but as her first thought. Um, is it, does anybody work anywhere where uh, like the triage staff or the nursing staff just does procedures like that without oversight? Yeah, I mean, it certainly depends on where you are, but a lot of places that have very phys few physicians, uh, nurses do a lot of work. Um, I know like, so, I mean, Sub-Saharan Africa is of course always the like example, but that's a big area of malaria wars and stuff where you know, the docs aren't there overnight and kids crash and the nurses manage all of it, you know, a crashing kid. Yeah, so I, I think that's just something to kind of keep in mind, uh, depending on your work, where you work can be quite different. I mean, I work at two places, a like 800 bed level three center, and then a 10 bed critical access place. And that's about an hour apart from each other, both in the same state and remarkably different. So this case is done on a small like island nation, you know, hours and hours away from a potential higher level of care, which is interesting. I did think it was, another thing that was interesting was the person who was on a rotation at this hospital at the time as part of an undergrad study is the reason the patient was uh, treated with warm water immersion. I thought that was really cool. It just shows that as a student, no matter what your training level is, if you've, if you've got some training in something, you can definitely affect care. So keep that in mind. You don't have to think that as a student on shift, you're just sitting there um, slowing people down. You can definitely uh, affect a patient's outcome. Any other questions about uh, the stonefish article? All right, uh, one more, we have one left. Um, I think, Sohil, I think you've got the article on uh, whiptail sleep rings. Yeah, yeah, I'll be sharing my screen right now. Yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna mute myself.
All right, can everybody see that? Cool. All right. Um, hold up, I wanted to change my cursor. If I can do that. Uh, no, it's all right. Okay, so hello, I'm So Hill, and I'm a student at uh, West Virginia School of Osteopathic Medicine, and I'll be going over this case report on the whiptail stingray injury. So a little background, and I know that Gabby and Kristen already shared a lot, so I'll go through this pretty quickly. But when it comes to stingrays, they are split into two super families, uh, the Miliobatidae and the Dasiatidae. And the one we're focusing on is the Dasiatidae, which is, which comprises of a lot of different types of species, and some of them can have their uh, barb length all the way up to 30 centimeters. And the one that attacked our um, our patient in the case, uh, that uh, the whiptail stingray um, you, is known to leave the barb behind in its victim and does have venom glands. But as Kristen, uh, Kristen mentioned is that despite having these venom glands, it's usually the puncture wound that is more detrimental. And we're gonna see that in this case. Uh, here's an image of a whiptail stingray, and we can see the barb right there. When it comes to how common are getting attacked by a stingray, it is it has definitely like skyrocketed over the years because water activities have just become more attractive. In the U.S., it is average fifteen hundred to two thousand per year, and it is usually in the extremities but sometimes it can be in the chest area or abdominal area, you know, where our, um, where the life-threatening organs are. Uh, our case is not in the U.S., it's actually in Mayotte, and we could see here, uh, it is these islands that are northeast of Mozambique and northwest of Madagascar, and that area does have a lot of different species of stingrays. So when it comes to our case, we have a 24-year-old man who was uh, spearfishing and he saw this uh, stingray and decided to just swim with it. And that's just a big red, red flag right there. Um, so naturally a stingray that feels threatened will attack. And unfortunately the man got two puncture wounds, one in the neck and the other in the left chest. So with the energy that he had, he was able to yell out for help. And there were two witnesses that spotted him and pulled him out of water. There were also two doctors who came to help out. And during that time, just quick, quickly, there were symptoms just building up. The patient was in respiratory distress and there was already swelling in the face and the neck. So they brought the man to shore and unfortunately there was no phone service and there was no um, convenient way to reach out to medical emergency. So this case does go to the doctors improvising with what they have as the patient was starting to have difficulty breathing, was starting to lose consciousness, alertness, and even had high heart rate. So before breaking down what exactly the doctors did, here's what the patient had. So he had the puncture wound on the neck that did affect his trachea. And then the other ones on the left thorax, the doctors did notice that the right chest was rising and falling normally, but the left was not. So that screams out pneumothorax right there. So the doctors had in hand a fillet knife, and here's the image of it. So they used that to get access to the pleural cavity, and then they had a pen that they just took apart and decided to use that as a chest tube. And that actually worked out really well because the patient was doing a lot better. And then an hour later was when medical assistance was there. And by then, the patient was 
stable with a heart rate of 109, respiratory rate 22, uh, blood pressure 133 over 84, and oxygen saturation of 97. So the medical team was able to administer morphine and replace that pen with an actual uh, chest tube. So then they transferred the man to the local hospital, which is a small hospital that did not have a thoracic center. They did have radiology, endoscopy, and laboratory. The laboratory did show normal hemoglobin levels. For radiology, they did get um, first a 2D scan where we can see the barb right there, and we can even see air in the pleural cavity. And we can see that that's the heart, so this is in the upper lobe section of the lungs. And then they also did a reconstruction, got a 3D image where they were able to measure the barb more accurately, and that was about eight centimeters. So this hospital didn't exactly have the expertise or the tools to pull out this barb without causing more severe damage. So they did the best they can and uh, gave the patient antibiotics and treated the neck wound. The plan was then to transfer him to a bigger hospital with the thoracic center. So the one that was closest was um, 1,500 kilometers away. And I know that that's kind of foreign to us Americans. So by flight, that is about two hours. And the unfortunate thing was uh, he didn't get transferred right away. When it comes to a small island like that, there was pretty much uh, the transport service is only one airplane per day for a medical emergency. And apparently for that day, it was completely filled up. So our patient had to stay uh, overnight and then the next day was transferred. And during that transfer, he was on oxygen and had a one-way valve. Then at the Union Island Hospital, which is a university hospital, they had all the equipment he needed. So first they made sure that the neck wound did not go deeper than, um, you know, to, um, to damage uh, beyond the trachea. And then when it came to the thoracoscopy, they were able to use that to guide uh, removal of the barb. And that did cause severe bleeding, which was controlled. That was the barb that was pulled out. And we can see the severe bleeding was caused by these serrated edges. So it is definitely one of those cautionary things to keep in mind when it comes to an attack like this. So then because of the damage that was done to his lungs, they had to do a resection of the segment that had the most damage. And the patient was completely fine then, just had to stay for six days and then was discharged. So when it comes to this case, the biggest lesson that we can get out of it is education and avoidance. As we know, if you're gonna enter water, there's that shuffling walk that you have to do. Um, when it came to this case specifically, if you see a wild animal, it's best not to bother it. Just you know, keep your distance and admire it. Um, but if you are interested in swimming with a stingray, there's a WikiHow page on that. And one of the biggest messages it's gonna give you is, Go with a professional. There's many services out there, especially if you're going to be somewhere like the Caribbean or any area where stingrays are popular. That means there's going to be tourist guided um, services around. Um, of course, if you do get in the situation of getting attacked by a stingray, of course, the first step is to be removed from the water. And uh, if these antibiotics are available. This is the most recommended way to go. And then since it is a puncture wound, a tetanus shot is also recommended. Um, 
And then when it came to just a little breakdown about uh, the tension pneumothorax, it is a medical emergency. And usually the standard way to approach it is using a large bore angiocatheter. But if you don't have any tools, uh, our doctor did, uh, our heroic doctors who were on the beach did have the pen. But if that wasn't available, there is such thing as a finger thoracostomy. And you can find videos on that. You still need some sort of blade in order to access the pleural cavity, but just doing it without any sort of chest tube can help out with the situation temporarily. And then as mentioned in previous presentations, um, the best way to approach um, decreasing damage from the venom is to be in warm water. Uh, there is minimum evidence to back up how much this helps, but it's still one of the steps that you might as well take because it can delay some effects. Um, a little more on discussion is just some comparison to other cases. So according to this report, it is the first reported case of a tension pneumothorax from a stingray attack. Beforehand, there were three other cases that presented pneumothorax and all of them ended positively. Um, one unfortunate case was with Steve Irving. So that was unfortunately a quick attack and a quick death. And it was one of those situations that not much could, could have been done. And then another case that was a little bit in the opposite end where there was an attack, but then six days later, apparently the patient passed away due to a cardiac arrest. And it wasn't until the autopsy that was discovered that how much damage was truly done from that, from that puncture wound. And uh, the report didn't go into too much details about like what evaluations were done during the, during the time that the 12 year old boy was in the hospital, but it just comes to show that a thorough evaluation is definitely needed and the right expertise and equipment are very important when it comes to dealing with removing a stingray barb. So that is the case report. Here's uh, the article and some of the extra resources I use for, the, for mainly the images. Is there any comments or questions? I just think that patient sure got lucky. He happened to have two people nearby who had what they needed and knew what to do. Something, uh, I just read that article. And I was like, well, this is straight out of a cool movie. Let's use this one. Um, <laughs> and I figured it would be pretty, pretty good read. Um, any comments or questions? Um, well, anyway, he mentioned a finger thoracostomy. Um, basically, when doing a chest tube, you make your cut, you dissect with your, your clamps, penetrate through, um, and then you should get your rush of air right then. And if you don't, I just happen to be in a trauma bay, um, and you can keep your uh, Kelly clamps in place, you just like shove your finger in the hole instead. And that's going to maintain the opening. Um, I mean, if that's all you got, that's all you got. But um, yeah, pretty lucky to have somebody right, two people right on the shore in, a, in an island uh, off the coast of Africa. Um, there were two other cases, and I'm, I'm going to try and put them all online in the Google Drive, but um, I still have to find them. There was a, uh, I haven't printed. There was one case of a fisherman, very similar. He was, uh, he had a net of catfish, marine catfish, uh, and he decided to hold them all against his chest like this. And this particular species, and apparently they all do, um, marine and freshwater have, I could show you a picture, but let's say this drink is a catfish. Their pectoral fins on either side have barbs that do contain venom and can be up to, I think, two to three inches long. So he had the a net full of catfish right against him. One of the catfish pectoral barbs just penetrated straight through his chest 
directly into the uh, left ventricle. And he died within, I think, 30 seconds to a minute based on the article. He just felt sudden chest pain, went underwater. His friends pulled him up immediately, and then he was dead. Um, but not as cool as somebody who heroically being saved with it a knife in pen. So uh, sometimes the fun survival stories are good. Uh, there's an, also a guy who was on a boat uh, fishing and a needle fish, which um, this one must have been a couple of feet long, jumped out of the water, got the guy right in the neck and its beak broke off like a, uh, I think they said a six to eight centimeter uh, chunk was stuck in his neck. And um, the initial treatment team decided uh, no imaging was necessary. We'll just pull it out. And uh, they just took it out and sent him home. And the next day he came back with a pretty darn large uh, pneumothorax. So um, cases, cases like these are, I don't want to say common, but the case reports are sure out there. Um, so any questions about marine animation? I know we covered a lot and we've been doing this for an hour and a half now. I saw somebody's hands up. Douglas or Doug, anything to say? Yeah, hi. Hey, how you doing, Justin? I miss you, man. Um, I had two comments. The first was on the finger thoracostomy. I've done about a hundred of them on cadavers, and I've done about three on real patients. Um, you really, you make this incision. You really need to like work your finger through the soft tissue in the pleura. It's harder than it sounds. It takes a little bit of effort. I think about like sawing my finger back and forth through the tissue to, to, to break through. So it's, it's not that you just poke it through. And so I, I, I've done it a few times. I just wanna make it clear that it's, it's possible, but it's not instantaneous. It's a little bit hard to do. The other comment is on the original article from the emergency medicine clinics that you presented at I don't know what, seven o'clock. I was actually the guest editor on that. That article was perfect. I didn't have to edit anything. It was so well done by Dr. Auerbach and Kristen Hornbeek. Um, I just submitted it as is. And the summary was excellent. So I know there's not a lot of people on this call, but just be aware that the summary tonight was spot on and excellent and I really appreciate it and thank you so much. Yeah, we're uh, lucky to have had two people who are articles, uh, article editors and authors join us tonight. So thanks for joining. Yeah, uh, I didn't have to do anything. I just submitted, it was so good I just submitted it. <laughs> um, you know, and I miss, I miss Paul, he was awesome. I yeah, really miss him. Yeah. Uh, I think that's one cool thing about the conferences that you go to with WMS is uh, the like the giants of WMS, uh, wilderness medicine in general, are just kind of sitting around in hiking shorts and t-shirts like the rest of us, and they will come up to say hi to you, or you can just go up to them, and they're awesome. They're right there, and, and I'm not one of them, but they are right there. Yeah. And thank you so much, Justin. Yeah. Um, my first chest tube I ever did was... Um, I think I was an intern. Um, I would strongly recommend whenever but anybody does their first one, it's use your body weight when you lean in to penetrate the pleura. Don't push with your arms. I Definitely. push with my arms. <laughs> you can't penetrate. You need no. your body weight to poke through or you won't do it. You won't get in. I, I put my left hand a, a few centimeters back from the tip and I put my right hand on, you know, where the little holes are, where the loops, and I push in. Mm -hmm. I'm like, 230 pounds. It's not trivial. Yeah, it, it's surprising. You got to control it, but you got to push. Yeah. Um, uh, anyway, I just think the topics like these are super cool. So hopefully you're all just as interested as I am. Um, next month's topic is anaphylaxis. The WMS guidelines are a bit more uh, brief than other topics. So we'll probably get fly through those and then we'll get through some cool articles. Um, my fellowship, not me particularly, but several of the members of our fellowship have published a couple articles about how to, uh, I don't, know, I don't want to go into that, a couple articles about it. So we'll have some people who were authors join us then. Um, if anybody's interested in presenting, just let me know and I'll try and send these cases out earlier. It's just, 
it takes me some time to get through them. So there's a lot I read through, but uh, thanks for everybody who presented and uh, thanks for being patient with me getting them out to you. Uh, well, thanks everybody for joining this month. I'm going to stop the recording and uh, I'll see you guys next month.